Hello. So my, my name is Yasmin Naya, as all of you know, and I am here today to talk about the issues facing LGBTQ media and the questions around what issues should we cover, how do we go about covering about questions around identity, intersectionality. Um, my thanks, first of all, to Bill and uh, Sarah for organizing this panel, and I'm deeply grateful to everyone else being working behind the scenes as well, of course. Um, um, as I understand it, today's um, t today's conference is about moving beyond the marriage equality, or what I prefer to call gay marriage uh, topic, and uh, the mainstream concerns around hate crime legislation, I assume, and um, DADT and so on, of course, are far behind us. And right now we're in a historical moment where supposedly, uh, and I think this is actually true, uh, mar gay marriage is going to become the law of the land. After all, the Supreme Court itself has decided that. Um, so technically we are now at a moment when we're asking, well, now that we have marriage, where do we go from here? And uh, what other issues can we possibly look at? Um, and what I want to do today is to frame everything that I'm going to say within the context of gay marriage, even though I know a lot of people are saying we really need to move beyond it. I want to make a very important point, which is um, that there is no beyond gay marriage. Um, there never will be a beyond gay marriage for a very simple reason, that gay marriage has effectively ruined the LGBTQ community's emotional, political, cultural, social, uh, and financial health. So when we speak about moving beyond gay marriage, we are deluding ourselves into thinking that somehow there is now this other paradise, right? That we have now achieved paradise, rather, and that now we can move beyond marriage and we can start to look at all these other issues. My point is simply this. We have made it incredibly difficult because we have effectively defunded the LGBTQ community in terms of both political energy and in terms of economic health. Um, that has become impossible to even think about other issues effectively. When we do think about them, when the mainstream organizations like Human Rights Campaign and the Task Force and the wealthy uh, or rather comparatively wealthy organizations in Chicago, for instance, like the Center on Halstead, decide to pour money into causes like, for instance, LGBTQ youth homelessness or geriatric, LGBTQ geriatric care, it is with a very... Um, it's with a very cynical point of view, which is to say it's all about getting funding. It's all about getting money. It's all about getting CEOs. And that's the graph that I asked um, to have put up today. It's all about getting executive uh, salaries. Uh, it's not really about doing anything within the LGBTQ community. So I wanted to sort of have that um, hover over us today um, and to think about that as the real framing and not simply assume that there is in any in any real sense a kind of beyond gay marriage. So having said that, um, you know, I want to raise the, I want to address the question of intersectionality, which is which is among the questions that we're going to be addressing today. Uh, this question of how do we as journalists and as readers think about issues affecting people in an intersectional way. Now obviously there's a long history behind the concept of intersectionality, Kimberly Crenshaw, etc. But I think what we're doing today, of course, is to look at it in a more quotidian way, right? Which is to say, how do we as people affected by multiple identities, how do we engage questions as reporters, as subjects, as readers? How do we look at the complexity of issues, the complexity of identities that people bring um, within very specific situ within situations? Um, you know, to be honest, I think that intersectionality is, is the um, is the diversity buzzword for 2015 onwards, right? For the for the mid 20 well for the 20s. Um, I don't think it actually is particularly meaningful to think about intersectionality simply in terms of people's identities. It makes absolutely no sense to me. And here's, I'll give you concrete examples. I live in Chicago. Everyone I know who works in the activist political community in Chicago works on a confluence of issues. And I have, I'm in, I'm fortunate to be in contact with some amazing groups like um, Chicago Freedom School, Project NIA, the Reparations Project, which is about ensuring that the city of Chicago finally 
not only acknowledges but also pays uh, victims of torture for the years of anguish that they suffered. Um, and the moratoriums and deportations campaign, which is uh, outside the mainstream immigration movement and which is devoted to thinking around immigration issues in a very specific economic context. Uh, so I, you know, those are just some of the people that I I know and I sort of tangentially sometimes work with. Um, those are the projects that most excite me. And I can assure you that um, if you go to meetings of these organizations, um, 50 to 90 percent of them uh, are comprised, I mean, 50 to 90 percent of the people at these meetings are often what we might refer to as LGBTQ people. But these are not quote unquote queer organizations in, in, in specific ways. However, the issues that they all face, um, which is to say, uh, the ways in which, the, the, it's not that their identities are intersectional, it's that the issues that they live within and fight against are intersectional, or rather are sometimes cutting against each other. So for instance, I live in a, I live in a city with a lousy transportation system. Yes, it's better than most, but it is a lousy transportation system. What is most terrible about it is that it is a deeply segregated system. It is a system that ensures a furthering and a deepening of the racial divide. It is a, it is a system that ensures that the city functions like a plantation. Right, so that's one of the issues facing, especially low-income people, especially African American and Latino people, are the ones who suffer the most um, from this horrendous transportation system because it it very effectively keeps the mostly white, wealthier North Side separate from the South and West Sides, for instance. So that's one big issue. Um, the other issue is around police brutality which is a massive issue. The fact that we have something like a reparations project tells you a lot. Uh, but this is police brutality has been a historical reality in Chicago. It has become worse with increased surveillance, increased policing of very specific areas. Uh, we have the so-called progressive candidate for Mayor Chuy Garcia now promising to unleash, uh, frankly, uh, 1,000 more cops. And that's the progressive agenda. So that tells you a lot about the state of siege under which many communities are living in, uh, under which many communities live in Chicago. So that's another issue. Um, the questions around, um, so these, you know, there are questions around evictions. Um, the city has a high foreclosure rate, uh, higher than it, what it admits to, for instance, economic deprivation in many, in many parts of the city, food deserts, you name it, we have it. Um, a lack of housing, a lack of affordable housing. LGBTQ people are living in all these issues, are living within the kind of nexus of these kinds of issues, and they're facing the intersection not of identities, but the intersection of various kinds of brutality, right? So intersectionality is a useless term if we simply think about who people are, what the press, and this goes for the straight and the gay press, what the press needs to start to do is to think about intersectionality not as a question of identity, but as a question of what people face, what kinds of intersectional brutalities people face, and the tremendous, um, uh, the, the, the tremendous burden that they're facing under a neoliberal economy, right? Under cities like, in cities like Chicago, which are so heavily privatized, uh, which have been sold out, literally. Um, we can talk later about our infamous parking meter scandal, for instance, which have been sold out literally to the highest bidder, or in some cases the lowest bidder. Uh, it's all about who your friends are in, in terms of contracts and so on. Um, so, you know, mental health centers, uh, the shutting down of uh, mental health centers in parts of Chicago, the fact that the south side of Chicago does not even have a tangible um, does not even have a trauma center. So those are the kinds of issues that I'm most concerned about as a queer person. So I don't really think about this in terms of how do I, as a queer person, negotiate all these issues. I think about it as how do I, as a, how do people like me and not like me, how do poor people, how do brown people, how do LGBTQ people, how do immigrants, how do all these people deal with this kind of daily constant brutality? Um, and that it is relentless. Um, I think that's something that we have to think about. So that's what I have to say about intersectionality. It's not about identities. It is about the intersectionality of oppression that we really need to think about. Um, and, you know, in terms of what should we cover, I think that the gay press needs to start to think about LGBTQ stories, not again in terms of identity, but in terms 
that they would look at if they were covering straight stories. So when you're looking at, for instance, healthcare issues and the LGBT community, stop asking, oh, how do LGBTQ people deal with, let's say, cancer, or how are, you know, how are they dealing with HIV and so on? Instead, start to look at the institutions. The healthcare and social service sector in the LGBTQ community is easily one of the most um, corrupt uh, sectors in this country. And Windy City Times has tried, for instance, to shine a light upon what happens to LGBTQ youth who are, quote unquote, the clients of the center on Halstead. Um, it has done some remarkable work, but that has mostly gone unnoticed because I, I think, again, the straight and the gay press don't really want to confront the reality of what goes on in the LGBTQ community. Um, again, as I said, the LGBTQ social service and healthcare industry is one of the most corrupt. I can assure you of that, having been both a reporter and an activist on, the, uh, on that particular front. Um, but no one's talking about it. And I think that's something, again, uh, the gay and the main straight press need to think about uh, very hard, very long and hard in terms of covering the complexity of all of that. Where does the money go? The graph I asked um, to have put up has to do with CEO salary. So okay, fine. You know, it, you know, some of those look like a lot. Some of those look not like a lot. I think the question though for us is not simply who's making what or how much, but what do they represent, right? So this is a large chunk of social service healthcare that all these organizations that have been um, discussed about in that graph that was sent around by the Washington, by the Blade a few weeks ago. You know, it's exciting and it's sexy to think about money, right? Who's making 300,000 versus who's making 45,000. But I think the bigger question is, what are these organizations supposed to do? And why do they exist in the first place, right? And how do they manage to funnel money towards themselves? It's not, you know, those numbers are not really all that large in comparison to the straight corporate pre uh, world, for instance. But the, it's not the question of the money, it's the question of what are they supposed to do and are they really doing what they're supposed to do. The Central Halstead, we know, is not doing what it's supposed to do, I can assure you of that, right? So why is, why is the gay media not, why are the straight media not following those particular stories? Um, so, you know, and I think these things relate also to questions around immigration as well. Uh, question, you know, we have to stop thinking about identity. We have to start thinking, start thinking about economic issues, political issues. How are those having an impact on LGBTQ people in particular? So I'll end there for now and I'll have more later. Thank you very much.